Hello everybody and welcome to today's talk. Happy that you found the time and appreciate that you're joining me today. Today's topic, business process outsourcing in the Caribbean. The pros and the cons and um, yeah, maybe a little high level um, assessment analysis um, of the whole topic. So before we start, um, let me know if you can see and hear me loud and clear, just to make sure that we get the best experience. Um, yeah, if you can hear and see me, just drop a yes or a one in the chat um, or in the comment section, so that I know that from a tech perspective, everything is working for today's live stream or for today's talk. Um, I will also play um, a few videos later on and um, yeah, let me know um, how the sound quality is because for some reason I cannot hear the sound while I'm playing that live, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so um, why do I want to talk about business process outsourcing in the Caribbean? Because I think that you know, over the years, over the last years, it became more and more a topic. Um, people started talking about, um, people present it as an option or as an opportunity to employ people in the Caribbean to you know, get more jobs and get more money into the countries. And therefore, um, yeah, I think it makes sense to spend some time and some thoughts um, around the whole topic, because in my experience, that there are yeah, always two sides um, to a story or to a project. Therefore, um, yeah, let me know your thoughts. Um, let me know how far um, yeah, you have research about the topic, um, maybe your experience, first-hand experience um, when we're talking about outsourcing, business process outsourcing, remote work uh, and whatnot. And uh, of course, as always, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and let me know, and then I will try to answer it. All right. Um, oh, one thing, by the way, um, if you are um, yeah, more the type um, of listening to these kind of conversations or these kind of talks, um, feel free to yeah, listen to the podcast version of this show, meaning yeah, you can find the Simon Cooper podcast on every major podcast platform. So you have the audio version there. Or if you also want um, to watch past conversations, past discussions with guests, and also want the video version, then I want to encourage you to check out the YouTube channel, also look at the past conversations. And of course, want to encourage you to subscribe there to get yeah, updated and notified whenever we release new content. That being said, let's dive into today's topic. Let me open my slides. And um, yeah, as I said, today's topic, business process outsourcing in the Caribbean, um, pros and cons, but um, I want to yeah, maybe answer a little more, a little more specific question today. Um, so my question or, or my thought behind that is, um, can BPO, can business process outsourcing or remote work create more sustainable jobs for the Caribbean as a whole? And um, I want to emphasize the sustainable part in that question. Um, or when you look at more um, from an economic perspective, can it help to increase the GDP of a country over time. Meaning, can we actually yeah, produce more? Can we actually create more value? And when we want to measure that, then we can yeah, use the GDP as a metric here. So that's the well, these are the two overarching questions that I want to answer today. Can business process outsourcing and remote work create more sustainable jobs for the Caribbean? And therefore, can it help to increase the GDP? And I want to yeah, structure today's talk in five different sections. I want to yeah, first talk a little bit about business process outsourcing itself, meaning definition, talk a little bit about the history, then look at the pros and the cons. And again, I'm really interested in your point of view. So feel free to yeah, share that with me. 
Then point number four, the outlook, what I think, um, yeah, what we have to look for over the next years. And then of course, a short conclusion and executive summary at the end, what I think, how we can use, yeah, outsourcing in general um, to increase the, the GDP or the wealth of a country. All right, step number one, definition. I think it's important that we all talk about the same thing. And um, I think it's kind of interesting yeah, when we talk about BPO or outsourcing or remote work in general, what yeah, everybody, the notions that different people have uh, when we talk or when we use these terms. So business process outsourcing is a subset of outsourcing that involves the contracting of the operations and responsibilities of a specific business process to a third party service provider. So that's one of the definitions that you get when you type in business process outsourcing into Google. In that case, um, I think that's from Wikipedia. And from my experience, um, we can differentiate um, when we talk about BPO in two parts, meaning we can talk on the one side um, about front office outsourcing. So that's a big subset. And that's everything um, yeah we basically have di direct uh, customer or client contact meaning customer service customer support that these are typical front office roles or front office outsourcing roles that we see in that area and then when we look at the back office that's uh, when we talk about yeah more about the OT, IT outsourcing, uh, maybe even coding, software engineering, um, these things, maybe just yeah, maintenance, um, everything supply chain. So now we are more in a yeah real world um, uh, environment, and of course um, production and assembly. And I will talk about that um, in a minute when I talk a little bit more about the history. So these are basically the two main areas that we can talk about, front office outsourcing, customer service, customer support. So everything that the customer sees at the front of the business. And then of course, processes that we can also outsource at the back end, often IT supply chain or production and assembly. And we'll talk about a few examples now. So for example, um, that can be one form of outsourcing. So what we see here is a picture of um, yeah, an assembly line or I don't know, sweatshop. I don't know how to call it. A lot of people um, working for Nike in, in Thailand and uh, yeah, producing clothes or shoes or um, I can't really see it here. Um, but yeah, that's one thing uh, when we talk about outsourcing or also business process outsourcing, meaning of the complete assembly maybe a complete production process here um, is outsourced. Um, but yeah, technically uh, everything that is remote work uh, or at least yeah, remote uh, work in terms of other companies or, or freelancers, um, if we talk about yeah, single individuals, um, that's also a form of outsourcing. And I think um, yeah, the term outsourcing itself has some connotation, um, probably more a little more negative one for a lot of um, people. Um, yeah, so I think it's important that yeah, it's a very broad term when we talk about outsourcing or BPO. So I think um, that's one important reason why we really have to look at, okay, what are we talking about? And uh, especially when you, when you want to plan for the future, if or if we want to ask, answer the question, um, if it's actually a yeah, reliable, solution um, to get more jobs into the country, to increase the GDP of uh, Caribbean countries. Uh, I think we have to look at the details here and not just say, well, okay, at least uh, some jobs better than nothing. Although I would agree um, that's a valid argument, but at the end of the day, um, yeah, we want stable, sustainable, good paying jobs. I think we can all agree on that. All right, let's look a little bit at the history. Um, so yeah, what is uh, outsourcing? Because uh, yeah, usually uh, everybody was producing everything in a very close uh, proximity and uh, yeah, with globalization, I think that's one of the main yeah, features or, or bugs or whatever you want to call it um, of globalization is that we started outsourcing 
uh, processes and tasks um, to places where they are more efficient, cheaper, or whatnot. And we'll talk about the reasons for outsourcing also in a second. But when we have a look at the history, um, I think um, yeah, the first outsourcing that we saw were really um, yeah, it's really some some time ago, primarily um, into Asia. Also, China would be China, where we're talking about production on supply chain, everything uh, from yeah, assembling stuff and shipping it to the US or shipping it to Europe. Um, yeah, was basically the the first time where we saw on a big scale um, that. Yeah, companies outsourced complete processes to other countries um, and not only source materials there, for example. Then, and I would say that's probably more in the in the nineties uh, now, where we um, switched a little bit. Meaning, um, yeah, it was not only the cheap labor in Indonesia or in, in China that was attractive for um, companies. Yeah, India learned a little bit um, about that and said, well, okay, we don't want to offer the, the cheapest labor, meaning just physical labor and putting parts together. Um, we educate our people a little bit and you know, make sure they, they can, can speak uh, English, uh, they can write, uh, they have basic IT um, uh, skills and therefore can be used in a modern company, in a modern workforce. And uh, yeah, then we so basically whole divisions um, being outsourced to India, big companies like Microsoft, uh, Oracle, SAP and whatnot, yeah, moved uh, a lot of their yeah, uh, business units and divisions over there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what we basically saw in the 90s and again, primarily to, to save costs, but we'll talk about that in a second. Then, um, at least from my experience, um, it switched a little bit, or let's say a new player kind of arrived over the last 10, 20 years um, with a yeah, more front-end uh, customer support approach, meaning when we talk about um, the IT or the outsourcing of, of yeah, IT services or IT support, uh, also call center and that kind of things to India, that was not the, yeah, the main focus. But now with the, with the Philippines, they really focused more on the, on the front end side compared to India, which was more on the back end side of things. And um, yeah, it's still today um, one of the main countries um, where companies outsource their call centers, the front end customer support, uh, customer service um, and whatnot. Mainly yeah, because again, um, people there speak proper English that just opens a big market. And um, yeah, you have good infrastructure, internet connection, and so on. And you are able to yeah, facilitate payments and these kind of things. So that's what we um, saw over the last uh, yeah, 10, 20 years maybe. And then um, yeah, kind of switch back to the IT or software engineering or coding side, at least yeah, in, in my experience over the last maybe 10 years. Um, that or yeah, maybe 15 years, we really saw that growing in Eastern Europe and um, yeah, a country that is in the news, in the news lately um, a lot, meaning the Ukraine, they um, yeah, realized that if you follow the channel or if you follow my content, then you know that I often compare um, yeah, the Baltic uh, countries, meaning Estonia, Lithuania and so on, to um, yeah, Caribbean countries, meaning small land size, small population and uh, yeah, no really natural resources that you can sell to get yeah, revenue into the country. And um, yeah, these countries then started to develop uh, or to invest in education and uh, yeah, digital education, IT education, software engineering, uh, and so on. And um, yeah, I think that's where we saw a big, not shift, but uh, yeah, development over the last maybe 10 years. So that these more sought after skills are or developed in, in Eastern Europe. And we saw a lot of um, that developing there. So that um, being said, that's pretty much the situation um, that we have uh, today. And we will see how the conflict in the Ukraine you know, affect some of these, um, yeah, some of these teams, or some of these companies, uh, or a lot of the people that um, are working there and yeah, working for a lot of IT or tech companies. So that being said, um, let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of um, yeah, business process outsourcing for, on the one hand, uh, yeah, the employees, 
Um, on the other hand, the companies and of course also yeah, from a more bird's eye view perspective, from a government perspective, maybe, or from an investor perspective. Again, the question is, okay, how can we yeah, build or attract sustainable, stable, and attractive uh, jobs for the Caribbean and yeah, therefore increase the GDP? So one reason um, why companies uh, outsource or why outsourcing in general is um, yeah, I think companies do um, is just because you have economies of scale, um, meaning at the moment where you don't focus on, yeah, you know, as a business don't have to focus on all these little tasks, but rather um, yeah, outsource this to a bigger company that does only that and therefore can streamline that, um, yeah, benefit from scaling effects and yeah, save costs. Um, then you just, you know, that when you buy in bulk and uh, things of that nature. That's probably the easiest example to explain that instead of buying yeah, every single item. Uh, once you buy one big chunk, one bulk. So economies of scale, um, yeah, at the moment you can outsource or when you can outsource hundreds or thousands um, of, of jobs, of often very repetitive or tedious jobs, um, then of course you will have some cost savings and that is probably one of the main incentives, at least in my perspective, um, for companies to um, outsource jobs or, or tasks or even certain processes. Um, yeah, I think every financial analyst or every accountant or every business analyst um, or yeah, investor, they see, oh, okay, or I mean, you know that by yourself. Um, when big companies um, announce that they lay off people or that they outsource big parts or big departments to cheaper countries, um, then you often see an increase um, in the stock price because the market's assuming, all right, they now will um, yeah, have some cost savings and therefore will be more profitable. And um, I would agree to a certain extent. Um, I think there's more caveat to that, but um, generally speaking, um, yeah, that is absolutely true. You can probably save 80, 90% of your labor costs, of your you know, uh, you know, labor costs, people, um, or what you pay people you can probably save 80, 90% uh, when you compare the European or the US market to uh, yeah, other countries where you can get that for a fraction of the salary. So, um, yeah, on paper, at least, you can save a lot of money when you outsource a lot of um, your labor. But we'll talk about that in a second. Um, if that at the end of the day really pays off um, is another question. Then um, what we also see is that most of the work or most of the jobs, or most of the tasks that um, actually get outsourced is often very repetitive and low skill work, or at least work that is um, yeah, very, very repetitive. And um, yeah, we all know, I don't have to tell you that, that that is usually um, a race to the bottom, meaning yeah, technology gets better, um, labor gets cheaper and cheaper. And if you only focus on offering cheap labor or cheap uh, work to the marketplace um yeah that's often not really a stable or, or sustainable business model um so yeah when um yeah let me know what your experience is but in my experience um the most jobs that are outsourced are not the high quality jobs you don't outsource your eceo that's just not or your c-suite that's just not what's happening it's usually yeah when you look at the organigram or the business structure, it's usually the lower levels um, of a company structure that gets outsourced and are therefore yeah, the easiest to replace. So if you are a country and you think about a strategy, how to employ people and you just say, okay, let's yeah, attract yeah, low skill works or that kind of job at the moment, um, yeah, someone else can offer that cheaper. You are, yeah, you will lose that lose these jobs. And um, one thing that I want to um, yeah, talk now a little bit or dive a little bit deeper 
is um, that I think most people are not really aware what threat um, automation is to a lot of jobs today, especially these kind of jobs, meaning jobs that are easily outsourced, that are repetitive, that are yeah, usually um, yeah, low, low skill um, jobs. Um, because technology is really catching up here, especially over the last, you know, let's say, 10 years. And um, yeah, especially automation, I think, will be a, or is already a big threat to a lot of jobs. And I think we need to keep that in mind. So what I, wanna, what I want to show you now is um, yeah, a video from 2018, so four years ago by now. Um, yeah, the Google Duplex presentation. A lot of you um, probably already saw that in the past, but just to give you a little refresher, was Google AI, um, what the Google team was already, Google software was already able to do um, yeah, four or five years ago. And um, yeah, if you're watching this live, please do me one favor and let me know if you can hear the audio of uh, the video that I'm going to play now, because um, as I said earlier on, for some reason I cannot hear the audio right now. So I really would appreciate if you can yeah, give me a one or a yes or something um, if the audio is working properly. So here comes a 90 second video. Our vision for our system is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we are working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this, but even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. What's oh, happening out here? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. First of all, thank you, Edwin, for the quick heads up that everything is working from an audio standpoint. Um, yeah, I found that um, demonstration yeah, a few years ago already very impressive. And um, I think if not already, then um, at least yeah, in the next few years, there are a lot of yeah, just call center agents or um, yeah, that kind of jobs. Um, that will just be replaced by that kind of software. And um, yeah, I think it really doesn't make sense um, to, at least from my perspective, again, um, interested in your viewpoint, doesn't really make sense to yeah, invest in that kind of jobs or uh, try to attract these kind of jobs if they will become obsolete uh, very, very, very soon. But um, yeah, not only these kind of jobs, meaning not only yeah, virtual assistants or, or yeah, making phone calls um, are going to not maybe not completely disappear, but uh, yeah, going to be um, reduced. 
also a lot of other jobs. So I have a second um, video for here, same length around, um, which I think Google released last week. So in the last few days, uh, last four weeks, and um, which just shows a lot more use cases or gives an impression of all the other use cases um, of that kind of technology. And um, yeah, therefore, I want to not only ask you to watch the video and get impressed, but also give you a little assignment, meaning try to count or try to figure out or try to imagine how many jobs or tasks that software or that um, demonstration, demonstration that we're going to see now um, is going to replace in the future. So the video that we saw a few seconds ago, or a few minutes ago was 2018. The video that we are going to see now is um, yeah, Google's AI, Google's technology today. And again, um, yeah, let me know if you can hear the audio loud and clear. Let's say Rob needs information on getting his first mortgage, but doesn't know where to start. First, he's connected with a virtual agent. Hi, Rob. Welcome to Silverbank. How can I help you today? I'd like to get some help on a house I'm looking at. I'm not sure what my options are about getting my first mortgage. Sure. Can you tell me what address you are interested in? Yeah, it's 52 Henry Street. Got it. Buying a home can be complicated. Let me transfer you to one of our specialists to make it easy. Google Dialogflow supports intelligent conversational AI. Context and sentiment are analyzed in real time and can be relayed when escalating to live agents. Hi Rob, my name is Maria. I'm one of our mortgage specialists. I see that you'd like to get a new mortgage. First, let's get some basic information. Could you upload a picture of the house in the app? We're going to look at both the property in question and your ability to qualify for a loan. Yes, let me grab it outside. Okay, just sent. Thank you, got the picture. Based on the information, it looks like you're pre-qualified for a loan. Yay! <laughs> Congratulations. I also see that you qualified for a line of credit to help with any renovations or additions you may want to make. Well, this will be our first home, and I'm sure there will be some things that we want to modify, but I'm not sure how that works. As the conversation continues, the case details from the connected touch points can be automatically stored in your CRM, including chat transcripts, audio recordings, photos, and files. With this data and agent assist, you can reduce agent handle time by providing turn-by-turn -turn guidance on the conversation flow based on customer intent. A line of credit will enable you to have easy access to liquid account that you can use or not at any point, depending on what you decide to do to the house. That would be great. Can I also look into adding that on with the mortgage? Sure, but I will need to validate your identity once more before qualifying you further. I'll send you a notification that will use facial recognition on your phone. Just got it. Thanks, looks like we're good to go. I'll have a loan officer reach out to you about finalizing the paperwork. Awesome, thank you. After the call with the agent, a notification regarding the new mortgage application can arrive on the phone, completing the multi-channel customer service experience. So what do you think? Let me know in the chat how many tasks, uh, how many jobs um, yeah, did the software or the AI replace in that clip? And um, yeah, even if you watch this um, as a replay, let me know in the comment section. Um, and what I often hear when I talk with people about that is uh, the argument, well, yeah, Simon, but they are not going to replace that completely. or not going to replace the human completely. Therefore, there will always be these jobs granted or that there always will be a human kind of oversee that stuff. But I think what people underestimate is that instead of 10 call center service agents, he only needs one. Or instead of five marketing managers, uh, you need one. Or instead of 10 credit uh, loan people in the bank that uh, yeah, process the, the applications, he only needs one because at least from my experience from, from working in the bank back in the day, or generally speaking with bigger corporations or organizations, a lot of the time people are just busy with data entry and then requesting information. 
because the systems are old, uh, or there's still a lot of uh, paper involved um, and whatever. And um, yeah, therefore, I don't want to say they are going to replace jobs completely. I think that's the wrong approach. But again, instead of 10 people to doing one job, you know, only need one person to do that, or maybe to oversee the software or the AI or to escalate some yeah, edge cases that have to be handled by a human. But the other nine people, yeah, either you have to find a job for them in the organization or in the economy in general, or um, they yeah, will get laid off. And um, yeah, that's why I think we need to be aware just how much the whole topic automation to get back to the presentation um, will affect um, not only our life uh, over the next years. Um, I think yeah, everybody can probably agree that technology is evolving in a yeah, really fast pace, but also from, from a job market perspective that we have to make sure um, or we have to ask the question, okay, how do we make sure that um, yeah, people will be able to compete or that we have enough jobs for people in the future and that they don't get replaced by, by robots or by AI. So let's have a little outlook. Let's um, yeah, do some, make some predictions, let's look a little bit in the future. What do I think? And again, if you're watching this, um, let me know what you think. Or if you have any questions, um, if you disagree with me, if you agree with me, I'm always um, yeah, very open and very interested to hear other points of view. So um, when we look yeah, in the future for the next years, decades to come, I think the question that I think every country, but um, when we're talking about the Caribbean, the Caribbean uh, in general, has to ask itself, what will be the product the Caribbean offers the world? What is the product, or of course the service, but um, yeah, just use that word product, um, that the Caribbean will offer to the world economy. Because, um, yeah, if you remember the first so one, the two questions are how can we, yeah, create uh, sustainable, attractive jobs on the one hand, and on the other hand, how can we increase GDP? And, um, yeah, GDP stands for gross domestic product. And I want to give a big shout out to my buddy, Dan Gamito, that yeah, kind of pointed that out in the conversation we had the other day that, um, yeah, there's a reason why it's called gross domestic product, because you have to deliver a product to the marketplace that is valued by the marketplace. And I think that's the question that we have to ask ourselves, ourselves what do we want to be the product um, that the Caribbean offers in the future? And um, do we really want to offer just cheap labor? And that was the value proposition of a lot of countries, companies um, in the past, um, meaning yeah, China, India, Philippines, all these countries basically said, well, you can get labor cheap here, or we produce cheap here. The value proposition was, at least from my perspective, uh, from my perception, never you get high quality labor or high quality products. I mean, it's, yeah, at least in, in Germany, kind of the same. Yeah, China quality or made in China is sort of kind of synonym for bad uh, quality because yeah, if you want to have good quality, you need to buy products that are actually made domestically, not everywhere, but um, yeah, just from a branding or a perception um, standpoint. So again, is the question: Do we want to uh, just export cheap labor? Is that the the value proposition of the Caribbean or? generally speaking, of a country, of a, of a company. Um, or, and I think that's the only, only answer, or are we offering innovative products? Whatever that might be. And I, might, I think when we look um, you know, at the last 20 years, especially from when we look at uh, technology or, or tech companies, um, they, of course, came very often uh, from the US, uh, Silicon Valley and whatnot, and we will talk about that uh, in a second, why that's the reason, uh, why that's the case, at least uh, from my perspective. But um, we also see that a lot of very innovative companies and multi-billion 
dollar companies um, are coming outside of the US or from very small uh, com countries um, where you maybe didn't even think that these companies are coming from there. And I think, yeah, with technology, with tech in general, and all the developments that we uh, are seeing right now or over the last years, I think, um, yeah, labor is not a value. But it's basically a commodity and it's not a very valuable one anymore. Um, that I don't want to talk about humans here. That's something completely different. But just from an economic perspective, that doesn't, yeah, I'm not talking about a human value. Um, but what the market values are innovative products that solve problems. That's it uh, very simply said. And I think that's what every uh, yeah, society, company, country, whatever, um, should focus on. Meaning the question, okay, how can I create innovative or high quality products? And um, if we want to build high quality products, then of course, uh, yeah, we, will, we need companies. Of course, humans, but usually that's not one human, but a group or a team of humans. And therefore we call that a company. So um, if we want to create or export um, great products, then we need great companies that have yeah, great humans in there that create these great innovative products. I mean, as you probably know by now, I'm German and uh, yeah, Germany itself, we also don't really have any natural resources uh, or cheap labor that we can export. So um, yeah, that was always the focus of the German economy. For example, we yeah, basically import raw materials um, cheap and create high quality products, machines, cars, and whatnot, and export them um, yeah, for very expensive um, to the rest of the world. And um, yeah, I think that kind of approach um, should we take here. So the question is, what are the requirements for building great companies that then create great products? And of course, um, there is no right answer to that. There are, yeah, master thesis, doctor thesis and whatnot. Uh, papers have been written about these questions, but um, I want to keep it as simple as possible. I think one foundation um, is just education, or not only education, but the right skills. I think um, everybody will agree with me that you need to have the right education, that you need to have the right skills, the right abilities to um, yeah, create products, to offer services in a modern world, or at least in the world we are living in. If you're not able to read or write or to operate a computer, then yeah, you are basically um, worthless for the, the work or uh, for the labor market. And therefore that's the first starting point. And then the second one, and um, that's something that I personally haven't really found a solution for as yet, or I think that's probably one of the most complicated things is um, if I now have qualified, educated, skilled people, um, now they need a certain amount of yeah, capital, a certain amount of funding to yeah, just try and fail, um, to put that money in research and development, uh, however you want to call that process from an academic perspective. But you need funding, you need cash, you need capital to yeah, kind of inject that as a lifeblood in that startup or even um, for a bigger company if that company wants to grow and to expand. So funding and capital is one big bottleneck that I still see. Um, I personally hope that we, yeah, in the future with all the fintechs uh, coming around, uh, maybe with uh, blockchain technology and whatnot, that it will be easier for outside um, investors or for overseas investors, for example, to invest very easily and very secure, meaning, yeah, why is Nigeria, for example, as a big uh, company with English speaking people, not one of the known countries for for outsourcing yeah because the nigerian print scam is literally now a meme um so meaning that country has a kind of branding or, or history of not being very reliable or to you know scam a lot of people so the question is how can we build an environment that is secure for investors that attracts investors that they know okay the money that i put in there although i have the business risk on the one hand and i know that business risk i don't have the political risk or the, the criminal risk or however you want to uh, label that that someone is uh, stealing my money along the way, corruption and so on. And um, 
yeah, I think uh, if we can solve that problem over the next years, then I think we will see a uh, yeah, real acceleration in that area because I know for a fact that there are a lot of people in the US, in, in Europe, in UK, uh, whatever that would say. I mean, think about yeah, the diaspora that is often living overseas or families and whatnot that say, all right, let's uh, put a thousand US dollar in that kind of project to fund that kind of startup. And if we get a hundred people together now, we have a hundred thousand uh, US dollar, which is in probably every Caribbean country, um, a lot of money. And now we have some runway and can yeah, try to develop that product that then, yeah, hopefully, or maybe, um, yeah, uh, is attractive to the, to the market and therefore we can grow the companies. I think that's one of the major bottlenecks. I see some, uh, yeah, light at the end of the tunnel from the funding and the capital perspective, but, um, yeah, still, yeah, still today, still till today a big uh, bottleneck or a big problem at least from my perspective um, i see some work there i'm yeah, in conversation with a few people in that regard but um yeah let's see how that plays out and again if you know more than i reach out to me i'm always interested in hearing more in that area all right so what is my conclusion or well, what are your thoughts so far let me know what you think for some reason can't really see how many guests we have today. Um, just as a general rule of thumb, um, usually you have the best experience on YouTube. Um, that's where all the tech um, is working and you can make sure that you see all, or that I see all your comments. That being said, um, yeah, if you like it so far, hit the like button, that always helps. Conclusion. Um, when we talk about business process outsourcing, um, in my experience, from just first-hand experience, um, I see that the whole cost savings are often negated by additional revisions and more complicated communication overall. Meaning, um, yes, you might save some money first or in the short term by outsourcing uh, a team or a department uh, overseas and yeah, save some money by yeah, saving or paying lower salaries, but that often comes with problems. You get more buggy software back. Um, the whole process is delayed, takes longer. Um, yeah, has more complications, needs more quality control, more revisions, and so on. And that, more often than not, kind of eats up the benefit or the cost savings that you had in the first place. Um, and if you're not able to manage that loss in quality accordingly, then um, yeah, it often comes with a loss in quality. So meaning you're just yeah, trading your cost savings for a loss in quality of product. And I'm not sure if you actually want that. So um, yeah, just from a cost savings perspective, at least in my experience, correct me if I'm wrong, if you have good experiences um, from a long-term perspective, at least I'm not talking about yeah, flexible or buffering some, some overhead or whatnot and to, to short-term outsourcing of tasks or to crash or to fast track or whatever but um yeah as a long-term strategy to have most of your business outsourced is probably not very reliable and i think we see that right now with all the supply chain issues that we have um, yeah with with uh, military conflicts in in europe unfolding and so on um i think the interdependency um becomes more more of a problem at least right now um on the other hand, of course, uh, yeah, the, the, the positive thing or the most positive thing is probably that remote work, if we talk about business process outsourcing, um, I think remote work is something that we saw in that area, at least over the last years, developing very fast. Remote work enables everyone to compete in a global marketplace. And I think um, that's on the one hand good, again, because now we just have better access to jobs and therefore to to money and uh, yeah, to feed your family and to make a living. But on the other hand, you need also to be aware. And now you compete with everybody in the world. So um, yeah, when you, back in the day, you maybe got some market protection because it was very hard for someone else to, to yeah, enter your market, to penetrate your market. Uh, now a lot of these borders, uh, yeah, hurdles are, gone and uh, therefore it's also 
yeah, it's harder for you to get a job because you compete with more uh, people. If you're a company, you have to compete with other companies. So again, everything has two sides. Yeah, what we also say, uh, saw, I think um, it's kind of self-evident uh, by now that yeah, repetitive, easily replaceable tasks and jobs will be the end of the food chain. Um, yeah, that will be just a race to the bottom, to the bottom. Um, and therefore I would uh, not recommend that to any company or country as a strategy. Um, I think countries and individuals have to make sure to invest again in education and as a result of that in high quality skills. I think that's the best investment that you as an individual individual can do and uh, that you as an executive or, or yeah, company owner or whatnot can do. Uh, yeah, make sure to invest in your people, in your team. Um, I rather have yeah, five high quality uh, people, highly qualified and trained people than 50 people that don't know what they are doing. And I think you would probably agree with me here. And um, yeah, I think that was the last slide. No, not the last one. This is the last one. Focus on building products and creating value. I think uh, no matter if we're talking about the company, um, no matter if we talk about the some company to be, meaning a startup, um, or if we're talking about a country as a whole, um, we need to think about that as a kind of business. Okay, what is the value proposition? What is the Caribbean or you as an individual or you as a company owner, as an executive? What are you offering to the marketplace? What nobody else does or what is your value proposition to the marketplace? And again, um, if it's just, yeah, we have cheap labor, I think that won't be enough for the future. But again, maybe I'm wrong and I'm happily to admit if that is the case. So that being said, um, yeah, let me know what you think. If you are live with me right now, um, yeah, put it in the comments, put it in the chat. Um, would you agree so far? What is your experience? Um, any disagreements or any question you might have that you might, uh, that you want me to answer right now? Um, yeah, what else? Oh yeah, if you haven't done so as yet, again, um, subscribe to the YouTube channel, leave a like. Um, and of course, if you're watching this as a replay and you have any other questions or any other topics that you want me to touch on in uh, yeah, future live streams or future conversations and discussions, then uh, please don't hesitate and put that in the comment section and I will more than happy to have a look at it. All right, so I think we have no questions right now. I think, or I hope that was beneficial. And um, yeah, I'm more than interested to hear your thoughts. Um, if you're watching this on LinkedIn or wherever, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and let's have a conversation. And um, yeah, so far, so good. Till next time, where are we? Here we go. All right, thanks for joining me today and I hope to see you next time. Have a good one, bye-bye.